She knew what was going on, what was going to happen. She knew. And yet she said, let it be as you say. So she was giving up everything for her God. God bless you and thank you for that. Thank you all for being here today. God bless you. We're going to do our Advent devotional first off the bat this morning so the kids can take part in that. So turn with me, if you will, to the book of Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to read that today. I want to encourage you this year that if you don't do something like this kind of thing with your family, especially around Christmas, if you don't do a special devotional, I want to encourage you to do that with your family this year. Just to add something um, in that so that it makes it more special than um, it has been in years past. Thank you, Mr. Janitor. But uh, doing something like that usually adds to the, to the presence of God in your home. And, and we've been doing things like that for since the boys have been really small, doing Advent devotionals, Lenten devotionals around those times to just draw close to God. And I want to encourage you to do that this Christmas season. So go with me to Luke chapter 2. If you are there at Luke chapter 2, say amen. All right. Starting in verse 1, we'll go down to verse 20. This is something we read every Christmas morning. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the entire inhabitant, inhabited earth should be taxed. This taxation was first made when Serenius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own city to be taxed. So Joseph also departed from the city of Nazareth in Galilee to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem in Judea, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So while they were there, the day came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same area there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And then an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were very afraid. But the angel said to them, Listen, listen, do not fear, for I bring you good news of great joy, which will be of all people. For unto you this is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this, this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with them an angel, of com an, a, an angel a company of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. When the angels went away from them the, into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let us now go into Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came and hurrying and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger when they had seen him. And, made the, and they made wide, widely known the word which was told them concerning the, this Christ. And all those who heard it marveled at what the shepherds had told them. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying pray, and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Right now as we light the last two candles 
Let's just take a moment and reflect on that story. And we're going to talk today about sacrifice. Father, thank you for your sacrifice of giving your son. Thank you that you have given us the ability to come before you and to uh, bring our needs and our, and our desires to you through your son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, thank you for your obedience to the cross that we too could come before the Father in reconciliation by your sacrifice. And Father, we praise you for that, in Jesus' name. The Lord be with the boys and with Amy as they do Sunday school. Touch them, bless them, anoint Amy to teach, anoint the boys to hear and to listen and to learn. And Lord, we thank you and we give you praise, in Jesus' name. Amen. The boys may be dismissed to Sunday school. We were, gonna, we were scheduled to do Romans chapter 15 today. But being Christmas holiday, I want to talk about sacrifice. And we kind of touched on it this morning in Sunday school. But I, I want to talk about it because we don't realize, we, we read the Christmas story, we, we get all warm and fuzzies inside and we think about you know the fireplaces and the chestnuts roasting over the fireplaces and all those things that you have with Christmas. But... This first Christmas and the, the months prior to that was not something that was enjoyable for Mary as a person. It was not something that was enjoyable for Joseph as a person. So we want to look at that. I want to look at that for a moment. I want to go back to Matthew chapter 1, and I want to talk with you about the sacrifice that Mary and Joseph made Now, we know that in the book of Matthew, starting in verse 18, in chapter 1, it says, Now the birth of Jesus happened this way. After the mother of Mary was engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, had in mind to divorce her privately. But while he thought, these, thought on these things, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For she who is conceived, for he who is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will, be bear, she will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. Now all this occurred to fulfill what, was, what the Lord had spoken through the prophet, saying, A virgin shall be with child and will bear a son, and, she, and, he, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted God with us. Then Joseph, being awakened from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him and, re, and remained with his wife and did not know her until she had given birth to her firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. Now, we know, if we read the Gospels and the accounts of this, we know that Mary had a choice in this whole thing. The angel of the Lord did not come to Mary and say, too bad, this is your call in life, this is what you're going to do. He didn't do that. He gave her a choice. He said, you're going to, this is what's going to happen. She said, how is this going to be so? I've never, I've never known a man. How is this going to be so? And he explained it to her. She said, let it be as you say. And I know, and I can understand in reading the commentaries and understanding the background material and the culture of that day, she knew what she was giving up. She knew it. 
Women who were found in to be pregnant without being married were considered adulterers. They were considered unclean. They were considered really nasty, and they, their families didn't want, didn't want anything to do with that for their own reputations, and so they would push those daughters out, and they would, that's how they ended up on the streets, begging for alms and things because their family would push them out. Now, she was smart enough to know that this was probably what was going to happen because her family was important to, in the area, they were, they had some sort, there was something to do in the reading that her father was a, was not in the religious sect, but he was a business owner of some sort. He was like, a, he was a carpenter or, or, or something. He did something like that. And so that could have, destroyed his business, they could have destroyed their reputation. She knew what was going on, what was going to happen. She knew. And yet she said, let it be as you say. So she was giving up everything for her God. She was giving up everything. She was giving up a home. She could no longer be with her parents. She was giving up security. She was giving up the idea of, of having safety and security in a home. She was giving up the idea that people would speak kindly about her. They probably talked about her behind her back and looked at her differently because of what was going on. You often wonder why she went to Elizabeth's house for six months. That could be probably part of the reason. But she went to Elizabeth's house for six months. So you see, there is so much that she gives up in this endeavor to give birth to God's son. Joseph in the same way. Joseph in the same way. The, the, the culture was, well, she, it's not you. You're, you're not the father, so put her away privately. Divorce her, stone her, whatever you got to do. If you're not the father, that was the culture. But he didn't do that. So then now he's got to deal with the idea and the, and the lookings at him as, well, he and her are not married. They've done this thing. Now he's also not looked at favorably either. And so his life has changed. Some would say for the worse, which in some cases it was, but for a greater purpose that we find in the end. Now, I want to bring this up to 2020, going to be 2020 in a couple of weeks. When Jesus comes into our hearts, when Jesus is given and we are given the opportunity to allow Jesus into our heart and give birth to that faith, <clears throat> our lives should change. Shouldn't they? Shouldn't they change? Shouldn't they be different than they were before? When I was first a Christian, I remember the pastor that I sat under said, you'll know you're a true Christian if your want to change. Not that, you, not that you are completely delivered from everything, but that your want to's will change. You won't want to do the things you used to do. You won't, want to, you won't want to be where you used to go, and you'll want to get to know God, and you'll want to understand God, and you'll want to do those things. Your want to's will change when you're truly a Christian. You will change. And then again, what else changes is the way people see you. Some people see you as a holy roller, talk bad about you, talk behind your back, let's see how long this lasts kind of thing. Probably kind of what happened with Mary. But she stayed the course, you see. She continued to follow God. She knew, just as I knew, 
with the way I grew up and, and my family. We, we, were, we were Catholics, um, not so much staunch. We were CE Catholics. You know what a CE Catholic is? Christmas and Easter Catholic, that's what we were. Okay, but we were still Catholic in our family, in our heart. And when I became a Christian, and I don't want to say that I denounced Catholicism, but I went Protestant instead of Catholicism, there was a little bit of a change in how I was perceived in my life and in my family and, and things like that. And especially when I followed the Lord in baptism after that, there were some things there. So you, you understand what you're giving up. You understand, you should understand, the things that are going to change. And we know that Mary knew those things that were going to change. She knew the culture. She knew the culture. She had to. She was, she was 16 or 12 or 13, I believe is what they say. But 12 or 13 in those days, they were, you were a pretty smart 12, 13-year-old kid. It's not like today where, you know, you, you bury your head in, in an Xbox till you're 20, and then you don't know what to do with the rest of your life. These kids were 12 and 13. They were preparing to build a home with a husband or a wife. They knew the things that they were going to be doing. They knew a trade or they knew how to take care of a home. 12 and 13 was, a, was very, very uh, adult in those days. So she understood the culture. She understood what she was giving up. And when we accept Jesus in our heart, in our life, do we really understand what we are doing, what we're giving up, or what we're saying yes to? Because... If we don't understand that, what we're saying yes to, then I think, it's, I, I think a little bit more of a heart searching needs to happen. Because what happens when you don't understand what you're getting into, especially as a Christian, then a lot of your uh, Christians that don't understand that, they walk away from that because they've lost what is comfortable you think about Mary, she was comfortable. She was living at home with her mom and dad, probably learning how to sew and cook and clean and all of those things to prepare to become a wife to someone. In that, that's comfort. If you think about your home, is your home comfortable? Do you like it? Do you, like, do you, do you, do you feel peace and protection in your home? What if you had to give it up? That's what Mary was facing. And she said still, let it be with me as it is that you say, knowing what she was giving up. And so today, when we think about this in 2019, 2020, we, we go out and we invite people to accept Jesus. We invite people to accept the Lord in their life. In a sense, that's what Mary was doing. She was accepting the Lord's call upon her life. So we, we invite people to accept Jesus Christ. Some of them understand what that means, what they're going to be giving up. For me, it was giving up uh, some sort of understanding that my family would see me differently. And I knew that. I knew that because I wasn't a Christian out of the gate. I mean, I, I uh, well, went to church for a few months before then. So I understood what was going on in the minds of my family as I was going to a Pentecostal church and I was growing up Catholic. So that's like north and south. If you're a Catholic and you become a Pentecostal, that's like over here and you're over here, okay? So it's, it's different. And so I understood what was going on in, in the heads and hearts of my family. And I knew after two or three months of going to church that if I accepted the Lord, that it was going to be more of the same or maybe even a little bit different as how people perceived me and saw me. And, you know, I did it anyway because I understood what God wanted from me. I understood God's call upon my life, and I understood God's call upon what God wanted me to do in the future. So many people don't understand that. You know, it's all an emotional thing. Mary was not emotional about it at all. She, asked, she had one question. How is this going to be? I've never known a man. And he explained it to her and she said, let it be as you say. 
Now, it doesn't say how, if she pondered it for a moment. It doesn't say that she pondered it, but it says she, she still said, let it be as you say. I think in the, in the two, three months I was going to church before I became a Christian, I pondered what my choice would be and what my choice would bring about in my life. And God's call won out because I knew God, I knew that if I trusted God, God could work everything out for his greatness, for his goodness. I knew that. So I chose God. I chose God. And Mary chose God. And you know, I, I love how it says in here that when he explains it to her and Joseph, it says that she pondered those things in her heart in Luke chapter 2. You know, when, when you're, you, 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 you make a change, she made a huge change in her life. She went from knowing what her day-to-day -day is going to be, comfort, understanding, and peace, to I don't know, to I don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. I don't have the comfort of home anymore. I don't have the, the protection of my family and my father. I don't know. So she had to, God had to speak to Joseph because that was going to be her protection, her home, her, those things. God had to do that. God was not going to make her give birth to his son by herself. God had to provide for her protection and comfort and peace. And that was Joseph. And then later, Jesus would be that for her as well. Not only physically in what he did in, for the home after Joseph had passed away, but he would deliver her heart and her soul and her spirit to be her Lord and Savior as well. You see? And so that was, she was given up and she knew it. And she knew it. She pondered those things. So if you think about it, you've got a two-year-old, three-year-old son sitting on your lap. Wise men are coming in, giving you gifts, saying, this is going to be the king. This is, I give you gold for a king and, and uh, frankincense for, for royalty and myrrh for burial. And she's thinking all of these things and pondering, what, what have I gotten myself into? Or maybe, you know, is this really true? At that point, only time would have told. And then we see throughout Scripture, now the, the Scripture is completely quiet from that story to when he's 12 and is in the temple. You ever wonder about that? What those 11 years or 9 years were like? I have a 7-year-old son. And I'll tell you what, 6-year-old and 7-year-old, and I'll tell you what, they're both sinners, I'll tell you right now. They're both sinners. But Jesus, Jesus, I wonder what it was like. I remember, do you remember Mark Lowry? Who, 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 who remembers Mark Lowry? A singer from the Gaither Vocal Band. He used, to, he, 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 he used to say, he said, God's, God's living in the house and no one's keeping a journal. God's in the house and no one's keeping a journal. But because there was nothing from probably age three all the way to pay age 12, so nine years or so, what went on? You ever think about that? I do. I think about that. Said he wasn't a sinner. Said, you know, he wasn't a sinner. He didn't sin. So was he the perfect child? Probably. Do we all wish our kids were perfect like that? Oh, yeah. But Jesus was perfect, and she pondered these things. She pondered the future of her life. She pondered the future of her son. She pondered the future of what she would, what would happen in the future. You ever, you ever do that? You guys have kids, and Ruth, your, your daughter's sitting with you, and, and, and uh, Joanne, you have kids, and I have kids, and Ralph, you have kids. They're sitting right up by you, and... And, you know, Lois, you have kids. You ever sit there and ponder when they were little? I wonder what they're going to, I wonder what they're going to want to do when they grow up. I do. I do. You can kind of tell with their interests. But if, if she was watching Jesus grow up, you ever, you kind of wonder if that pondering was 
the majority of his childhood. You know? Was he really the Savior? Was he really the one? He seems perfect. He's going to be, he's going to be something. Something that you want to know, too, that's very interesting, is that when God names a child, that child's destined for something. Something different. I mean, every child's destined for something. Great, I believe. Every child has a propensity to be something great. I believe that. But when God says, you will call him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins, that's a definite call, and that's a definite picture of what his life was going to be. Now, from the age of 12 on, we know that he's caught in the temple. He stays in the temple. They go out two days' journey, and it was one or two days' journey. Realize he's not with them. They go back, and he kind of gets in trouble, and he says, well, it was in my father's house. Why would you worry about me? Would any of your kids got away with that kind of an answer, Becca, if they said that to you? No. But she knew who he was. She knew who he was. And so they went on. And then from there to age 30, we don't hear anything about that. Nothing. Silent again. We can get indications that he worked with Joseph in the carpenter shop, and we can get indications that Joseph had died somewhere from the age of 12 of Jesus to the age of 30. We can get indications that Joseph died somewhere in there too because Jesus was taking care of the family. But we understand that Jesus had a purpose. That's why I said earlier, he took care of her needs physically for the home because somewhere in there it's believed Joseph died between Jesus' age of 12 and age of 30 because of the way it's written. Now, age 30, he realizes he has to go. And he has to fulfill his call. It's not his destiny, it's his call. People that say you've got to fulfill your destiny, I believe it's a call. Okay? And so he goes off up in the wilderness, gets tempted for 40 days. He's starving him, he's fasting for 40 days. At the end of those 40 days, he's at his weakest point, he's at his. Uh, most vulnerable, and the enemy shows up and says those three tests that are described in the book of book of First um, John as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The enemy gives him those three tests. He fights them with scripture. He fights them with scripture, and the enemy leaves. And then, as soon as the enemy leaves, the angels come and minister to him and give him food and drink and everything else, and then he starts his public ministry after the baptism by John. And then he goes and he does the whole, uh, he does miracles and signs and wonders, and we know the whole story. People don't believe him. Some people come to know him. He calls disciples, calls apostles. Of course, the religious people try to kill him. And then that very fateful night... When he, re, when he gives himself up in the garden to be crucified. And then he dies on the cross on a Friday. All talked about through his whole ministry, he told his disciples he was going to die. He was going to die. Of course, they didn't believe him. They didn't believe him. So you kind of wonder if they really believed who he was. Because if you know who he was, you would believe what he say. And that for us today is important too. If you know who Jesus is, you should believe what he says. Does God speak to your heart? I pray that he does. If he speaks to your heart, does he tell you things have to change or you can do this or you need to do that? And when he does that, do you apply that? Or do you say, well, I don't know if that's God talking or if it's my own consciousness or if it's my own conscience or if it's my own feelings. God speaks through his son. He goes and he dies on Friday on the cross. 
knowing farewell, full well, from the age of 30 to 33 when he died, knowing the pain, knowing the anguish, knowing all of those things. And yet, he followed through. The Bible says that toward the end, when he went to Jerusalem, he set his face like flint, the King James says, to go to Jerusalem. He knew he was going to his death. But he made a choice. His mother made a choice 33 years earlier, or 34 years earlier, if you want to count the nine months she was pregnant. 34 years earlier, to give birth to a son. Knowing the sacrifice that he was going to ensue. Jesus, 34 years later, makes a decision to follow, 30 years later, to follow that call and that decision to die on a cross. Not just because it's the call and you've got to fulfill it, but if you think about it, he did it for you and he did it for me. He didn't do it because this is what it says I have to do. He knew what it says after. The Bible says that Jesus was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So he knew right off the get-go, right at the beginning of age 30, maybe earlier, we don't know. It's not spoken of from age 12 to age 30. So maybe it could have been from then on, from earlier than that. But he knew his destiny, his call. He knew it. And not only that, he knew the pain. He knew the anguish. He knew the rejection. Do we like being rejected? You go for a job that you really, really want, you really think is really going to say, well, you just don't have the qualifications. We don't like those letters and those comments and those, those things. Jesus didn't like rejection either. It says he wept over Jerusalem. Jerusalem. He wept over Jerusalem because they still didn't recognize him after all he had done. So he knew the anguish. He knew the pain. He knew all of that prior to all of this happening. And yet he made the decision, just like his mother did. The sacrifice she made, you can mirror to the sacrifice Jesus made in his choice. But it was for a greater purpose. Her sacrifice was for a greater purpose. To save those from their sin. Jesus knew his greater purpose. To save those from their sin. Those who smacked him in the face, those who plucked his beard out, those who spit on him, those who slammed the, the crown of thorns on his head, all of those people, he came to save them. And he knew their hearts and he knew their minds and he knew them. And he still chose to go through this for you and I. For the promise. The promise was the resurrection of his, life, of his body. And every promise, every promise that is in this book is a mere uh, statement without the resurrection. It is not a promise outside of the resurrection. Everything that is in here, the promises, are made real because of the resurrection. Because of it. And it all started with the choice Mary made. If you want to go farther back than that, it starts with a choice Jesus made at the beginning of time, at the beginning of creation. The book of Revelation, chapter 13, talks about Jesus being the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He made this choice that we read about for Easter. He made this choice prior to God saying, let there be light. So the choice he made, that's how far back we can go, for you and I to sit here today saved, going to heaven to be with him. That is the choice that was first made. It's all about love. Mary loved God. Mary followed God. That's why the choice wasn't so difficult. 
Mary pondered things. Mary thought about things. I'm sure the sacrifice she made, and I'm sure the difficulties that they would ensue as parents and as people. I'm sure she thought about all of that. But the love for her God won out. You know, there are things God's going to ask us to do in our lives. God's asked me to do in my life. And maybe God has asked you or maybe will ask you to make sacrifices and make changes. Do we love our God enough to make those changes? That's a question we have to ask ourselves, isn't it? If God were to tell you today to do something that you think is unthinkable and you knew in your heart that it was God, would you love God enough to say, okay, God, okay, if you say so, let it be as you say. Do we love our God enough to say that? To be able to do that? I'm not saying it wouldn't be a struggle, but I'm saying do we love our God enough to go through the struggle and at the end of it say, whatever you say, God, I'll do it. That's a question we've got to ponder. That's one of those pondering things. And a lot of that is part of us understanding where we are spiritually and where we are in, in maturity with God. That's why I always say almost every Sunday, right, Brenda? Get into the Word of God. Read the Word of God. Get into it. Understand it. Study it. Spend time with God. Spend time with God. Spend time in His Word. Pray. Talk to God. And then the crucial part of that whole thing is to shut up. And what I mean by that is this. You pray to God, you read His Word, you talk to Him, and then you stop. And you let Him talk back to you. That is the point in your time with God that you realize that God might be speaking something to your heart that needs to change. Or He might be speaking something to your heart that you need to either grow in or you need to stop doing. And then where the rubber meets the road is, are we going to apply those changes? If God tells you to stop doing something, are you willing to stop it? Or if he tells you to start doing something, are you willing to start it? You see, do you love God enough to do that? Mary did. Mary loved her God enough to, do, to go through all of that. Jesus loved the Father enough to go through all he went through. Do we love our God enough to do that which he says to do? You see, this comes full circle. Christmas is not merely about a baby, but it's about a life-changing experience. Are we willing to, and do we love our God enough to do that which he says and to make the changes? That's why I said I wanted to encourage you to start a Christmas tradition in your home. How many people here do something at Christmas that is a tradition that you only do that involves Scripture? Okay. If you don't, I want to encourage you, and I'm going to challenge you, every one of you. I double dog dare you to start something this year. That's a movie reference, by the way. But I, I, I do. I, I, I want to encourage you to try something different. You know, when, I, when, when we were first married, my wife and I were first married, I want to be honest and totally transparent. We didn't do couples' devotions. We did our own devotions, but we didn't do couples' devotions. We just didn't. It just wasn't our thing. And it really wasn't our thing to do family devotions. But I felt that it was my responsibility as the father to start teaching my children the Word of God. And so we started that when the kids were old enough to understand what we were doing. And that's been since they're seven and six, so it's been about five years. We've been doing that. Because it's something that I felt God wanted me to change. And it makes a world of difference in your home. 
That's why I challenge you to try something different this year around Christmas time. Get into the scripture. Read the Christmas story. Open up all the gifts and then everybody get around the tree and say, now we're going to read Luke chapter 2. Well, Pastor Josh already did it. So what? Do it again, right? Read Luke chapter 2 as a family and reflect on that. Matthew chapter 1, 18 through the end of the chapter, and then Luke chapter 2 or something like that. And just reflect on that. Start something new. Start something new this year. Amen? Does that make sense? Did I cover too much ground in this message? I hope I didn't cover too much ground, but, but it all comes down to choices and sacrifices that we make every day. We choose every day who we're going to serve. Whether we understand that or believe that or not, when you plant your feet on the floor and you sit up in your bed and plant your feet on the floor, in that moment, you choose who you're going to serve. You get up in the morning and say, Good Lord, it's morning, or Good morning, Lord. That's an indication of who you're going to serve that day. But that is a choice we make. And some of those choices might come with sacrifices. Are we willing to make them? Like Mary did, Joseph did, Jesus did, and probably even Joseph's brothers and sisters. We don't know the effect it had on them, but I'm sure there was some. Sacrifices. Know that every sacrifice you make for God is for your betterment in God. To get closer to Him, to learn of Him, to understand Him. That's what it's for. Does that make sense? Let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you today for your word. Help us, Lord, today to make the necessary sacrifices in which you have called us to make. Father, help us to distinguish between our own understanding and your perfect will. Father, give us clarity in mind, clarity in heart, clarity in spirit. Father, help us this Christmas to start something new in our homes that would honor you and give you grace and mercy and, and would show others a reflection of our relationship with you. And Lord, we thank you and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for being here today. Once again, I just pray that this week that God blesses you, God ministers to you and your family. That your gathering times is spent and with love and joy and most importantly the Lord. And that he minister to you this week, give you grace and mercy. As you go through your week, I know this week's busy for a lot of people. The next couple of days is going to be busy. Pray that the Lord give you strength to do that which you need to do to prepare for the holiday. And that you are able, you're able to spend that time and uh, pray for your family. So, God minister to each and every one of you. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, Rebecca, thank you once again for blessing us with your talent. Thank you all for being here today. God bless you. Have a good week.